Like summer was all right until right about when school was about to start. I developed some kind of sickness that seemed like it was the flu. So I went to the doctor with Johnny, still had the headache, still had the fever. Um, but all of a sudden, we noticed that he had um, these little um, purple dots, almost like freckles. He wasn't too concerned, but the doctor still wanted him in to get a blood test and get a blood workup uh, on Monday morning first thing. 1.30 in the afternoon, the doctor called and he said, I've got some bad news. He said, um, I think that your son has leukemia. He said, I need you to go up to um, the PEDS uh, ICU right away. Uh, they will be waiting for you. And that was just way too much to comprehend. Then I heard this very urgent voice saying that, you know, something's wrong with Johnny. He's at the hospital. It might be serious. We don't know exactly what's happening yet, but I'm going to pick you up right away. Went up to the hospital, and, and that's really when the surreal part of this all started. I walked in with, with Deb standing with Dr. Mitchell and, and a priest, and Johnny was already up on, on the, the uh, intensive care unit, and the priest was, was already offering last rites. Johnny's case was really an interesting case as far as the laboratory is concerned. It all started with the phlebotomist at an outpatient draw site, and that phlebotomist drew the specimen. The specimen came into our um, Logic campus where the initial CBC was done and some of the initial chemistries. His case touched every single laboratory department from hematology, chemistry, uh, hemostasis, urinalysis, microbiology, um, blood bank, uh, flow cytometry, cytogenetics, every single department and many, many staff on all three shifts touched his specimens. In Johnny's case, we would have seen a, a really elevated white blood cell count. We also would have seen uh, the low platelet count, which together those are really indicative of a, uh, a, a bad situation, probably leukemia, but we wouldn't really know that until we did some other studies. And in addition, um, our technologists were seeing blasts in his peripheral blood, which to us usually signals um, possibly acute leukemia. Um, and so my first involvement with this patient was when I became aware that there was an abnormal blood smear on the patient. Um, the patient's physician was called with those results, and the patient was ev eventually admitted actually the same day that he had those initial findings. I met Dr. Mitchell and she was trying to tell me what they were going to start with in order to find exactly what was wrong with him. I explained a procedure called a bone marrow aspirate to them and um, we transfused him with platelets because his platelet count was so low. Uh, we gave him uh, vigorous IV hydration, intravenous hydration because of the height of his white blood count was high enough to cause sludging, can cause problems with clotting or even stroke. It, but it was so overwhelming that I just started to look away from her. And, and she, she just said, you know what, I need you to look at me right now and you have to understand what's going on. You gotta, you gotta be strong for him. The next morning we did a bone marrow aspirate and biopsy and then that's analyzed in uh, both pathology as well as flow cytometry and cytogenetics. Well, this specimen that we got uh, by reviewing the cases came in at 8 o'clock in the morning. I think by 9.30, uh, the proteomics or the flow cytometry was already completed. Dr. Pam Kidd, the hematopathologist, uh, looked at that within an hour of doing the procedure and called me within two hours to say, this looks like uh, acute myelogenous leukemia. Um, it looks like that, but that's not confirmatory until we see flow cytometry of the bone marrow. So when we had the flow cytometry data back, I reviewed this with John's parents, uh, discussed the treatment with chemotherapy for acute myelogenous leukemia, 
and discuss prognosis. Um, that uh, we had a fair chance of beating this, but it, it was a tough battle. The diagnosis um, that we arrived at was acute myeloid leukemia. Now there are different kinds of acute myeloid leukemia and particularly in terms of treatment these days, it's very important to know what kind of acute myeloid leukemia. In his particular case, we identified acute promyelocytic leukemia. It had a particular cytogenetic abnormality called a translocation 1517. So we were asked to perform the probe for translocation 1517, and when we did that, he had 96% of his cells abnormal. They did contain translocation 1517. So that confirmed the diagnosis. I'll never forget, I mean, she just came flying into the room. Just just big, big grin on her face, this Dr. Mitchell. Her, her coat flying oh, behind yeah. her, and I she mean. Said, Stop everything. <laughs> we got the lab results. We've got a, a type of cancer that we can treat with a, a very specific drug, but we know what it is now. Uh, we need to use less chemotherapy in that setting, and so less toxicity. And unless you've walked that path as a patient or family or physician caring for these patients, uh, limiting toxicity uh, was a critical point in this patient. It really made a huge difference to have an accurate diagnosis. This was like overnight, they had figured this out. In all patients with acute leukemia, um, we follow them very closely. Um, they usually receive a, a follow-up bone marrow examination um, on the eighth day of treatment, um, and then frequently on the 15th day of treatment, and then almost always on the day, of the 28th or 29th day of treatment, to see if they are, are in remission, whether their a treat, treatment for their leukemia is being effective. What we do is we go specifically looking for these same cells, uh, his disease cells, after seven days that we had found out the first day. And then seven days after that, we look for those cells again. I think that after, uh, after 14 days, flow cytometrically or from the flow cytometry lab, we did not see any more of, of the malignant cells. And also from that specimen, uh, cytogenetics got part of that specimen. And then they were looking for the translocation, the 15 to 17 translocation and to see if they could find any of these cells also. And so when, and morphologically, when the pathologists get the slide, if they don't see uh, what they're looking for, and you put all these three together, which I think is teamwork, um, then we're pretty sure that he's clear of the disease. So we're able to offer great reassurance to uh, John and his parents that he was still in remission and that we you know, expect him to remain in remission. Johnny's case is really exciting for us because it's one example where we really know the significant impact we made and the outcome. And there are many, many more patients that laboratorians take care of across the country every single day that you don't get to find out what's happening with the patient. It's interesting to me that I have the gratifying relationship with the patient, but I often tell families there are many unsung heroes, you know, behind the scenes, um, really caring about this child and contributing to the care and the success of our treatment. I really do feel like I'm making a difference in people's lives. I, I definitely feel it in those moments of crisis when people are standing, waiting for that result, and we can get that back to them, and we know that that has just changed the course of treatment for that patient. Scientists, they saved our son, and I want to thank them. That I, I am so grateful for what they have done for him. If I can meet the people that did all the lab work, I just, I would be so incredibly grateful towards them. I literally owe my life to them. This is John. He ran your test, and this is Dr. Kent. Hi, how are you? Doing wow. <laughs> wow. Nine years, nine years ago. Unbelievable. And now you're 15. 14. 14. 14. No, we, we celebrate with you in a strange kind of way. <laughs>